wiping it out on the guitar. So uh, that, that is great. That is great. We're beginning a new sermon series, and it's a short one. It's just in the month of July, and it's on two chapters in the Bible, the book of Romans, chapter 6 and chapter 7. And so today that is our text, and so we are uh, in that. If you don't have your Bibles, there are a few Bibles. Uh, we're reading out of the English Standard Version, page 1120. Under your pews, you can find the text, and uh, this is the text, and I'm going to do the reading today. Why don't you stand? You've, you're too comfortably seated. And this is what Paul is saying after the first five chapters. He's making a transition, kind of the theology to an application to us as Christians, followers of Jesus. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. That's the image of baptism. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We died to the old, resurrected to the new. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe we'll also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Thank you. You may be seated. If there is a hand next to you, take it as we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Paul is <clears throat> drawing a contrast between law and license. We see the same contrast between legalism and license in the most beloved parable of Jesus, the parable of the prodigal son. And the younger boy took off with license and uh, squandered his inheritance and riotous living in a far country. The older brother, the one who was steeped in law, who always was a good boy, uh, was very angry. And so this is kind of the continuum that we naturally are going to find ourselves in that we're either going to try to be good, and, and the tendency is then we begin to identify those who are bad, and we label them as such, we're good, they're bad, and, or we go in the other direction, and we become people that just don't have any rules, and we just do whatever we want. And so he's trying to say that this is the old form. Jesus talked about it in terms of don't be like them, and he identifies the two groups, the hypocrites and the pagans. He says, don't be like them. It should be somebody new, and that's what this is about. Last week, I shared with you a diagram that you could do on a napkin. In fact, it was really interesting because somebody came up after the 915 service and showed me a wristband, and I'd never seen this before. I didn't really know where this came from. It's just one of those things that's been in my head for a long time, and I'd never used it with you until last Sunday, but, but it, he has a wristband. He said, I've had it for years and years. And the wristband talks about the incarnation. That is, there's this, this line that comes, God became a human being. We call this Christmas, the incarnation. Emmanuel, God with us. God becomes human flesh. And so Jesus came and showed us who God was. And God is love. We, we know that, but we saw all of these different characteristics of Jesus. And what resulted was, of course, that he went to the cross. And there he died for our sins. We can't understand it, explain it, but Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament rules and laws of, of sacrifice, and he became the perfect lamb of God for us. And God placed on him our sin. They killed him, 
and they put him in a tomb, and he was dead. So this invalidates, it doesn't matter if he's dead and he's dead, it doesn't matter, nothing else really matters about, because lots of people were crucified, and lots of people claimed to be from God, but what makes this difference, and even in this text, it's throughout the scriptures, you see this, is that there was the resurrection. And when the resurrection took place, it validated all of the promises of Jesus for all time. And this is the key. You can't get through the New Testament without coming to the resurrection. The resurrection, take the resurrection out, we have nothing. We have absolutely nothing. And so this becomes our message. The resurrection then, he says that you're going to be my witnesses, and you're going to go in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. This is what you're supposed to do. We are witnesses, and that's what we talked about last week. One last thing that is going to happen is that Jesus is going to come, and he's going to, to come a second time. And so this is the message. We have no other message than this. As I began to think then about about this whole story, and particularly about the incarnation, let's spend a little bit of time of what this meant, what the incarnation meant, who Jesus was, what he taught, how he went about his life and his teaching. So there are six words that I want to share with you, and you could certainly come up with your own, but I would say that, first of all, that Jesus was magnetic. He was a magnet. He attracted people. He was so attractive. He was incredibly attractive. He could call fishermen out of their boat and say, come and follow me, and they jumped out of the boat and followed him. He asked people to give up everything, to follow him. They did that. People of all walks of life, People that were engaged in all kinds of different activities, pursuits, had different backgrounds. He could call people. People were attracted to him. They listened to his stories. They marveled at his teachings. They couldn't believe the miracles that he did. He was so magnetic. Children loved him. Rich people loved him. Some of the Pharisees loved him, but not a whole lot, it seems. But he was this magnetic presence. And I can imagine the disciples, after being with Jesus for a day, can you imagine the conversation around the campfire, what they were talking about? Did you see Jesus do that? Do you remember when he said that? And you see that lady walk up and she touched the hem of his garment and he was healed? I mean, it was a nonstop conversation. He was so incredibly magnetic. He was also somebody that was very intelligent. He had all of these stories. He had not only head knowledge, but he knew how to read people. He had intelligence in the sense that he was emotionally connected, and he would look at people in the eye. He'd block everything out, and when he had your attention, he was fully engaged with you, no matter what your background. He was so, so intelligent. Somebody made the observation that maybe that instead of Jesus, after his 12th year, remember, we had that, those, those silent years between 12 and 30, we don't know where he was. The last thing we know is that he was in the temple in Jerusalem, and all of the teachers were astounded at him because he had such great, great wisdom, and they listened to him. And so the tradition is that he went back to Nazareth and that he was his father's apprentice and he was a carpenter. Well, we don't know really what happened, but I've heard recently somebody else had a different idea. That is that he stayed in Jerusalem and became a Pharisee and became on this rabbinical track. Remember, he was addressed, they called him rabbi. Well, they wouldn't call a carpenter rabbi, but they called Jesus rabbi, teacher. Well, maybe he was a Pharisee and got caught into that tradition, and maybe this explains why he was so upset with the Pharisees, because he was one. And he knew all the inside handshakes and how they dealt with people, he really knew it. Maybe that's, who knows, we don't know, but it's, he was so intelligent. He was a man, he was called the Prince of Peace. He was, you know, everything would be, you know, going to hell in a handbasket, and he would just be calm, you know. Hey, you guys, yeah, there's a storm, so what? Yeah, you think you're about to drown, so what? Hey, I'm in the boat, you know, just calm down, everything's cool. You know, where are we going to get enough food to feed all these people? They're having their, you know, just they're pulling their hair out. And Jesus said, oh, well, let's, what do we got here? Well, we got, you know, we got five loaves and two fish. And yeah, I think we can handle 20,000 people with that. No problem. And it's like, wow. I mean, he's just, he's cool. Now, he could get upset. You know, he could take the whip to you, you know, to the folks that were over here because they weren't loving people. 
but he was a man of peace. And let me tell you something. There's something really, really wrong about our culture because we are so anxious. And this is what, you know, I'm spitting into the wind on this, I know. But let me tell you, social media can be so unpeaceful. It can be so destructive. And I don't know why people are addicted to it. It's like they're pouring, can I say crap, in your house, you know? That stinks, you know? You don't want that. Leave that alone. Be very, very careful of that. If you want to have peace, there's some things you need to turn off. And that may be the news. It may be, I don't know what it is. I got I to gotta tell you, the cardinals are so pathetic, I've started turning them off, too. <laughs> but when I get so upset at them, you know, you goofball, they only pay $18 million. How can you get picked off for space? So anyway, I found that's not an area of peace right now. So, okay. So I found out sometime this morning if they won last night, you know, I kind of reach. I don't care. It's like me and golf. I really don't care. Uh, but peace. He was a man of perfect peace. It would have been great just to look in his eyes and see perfect peace. He had a purpose. When he met Zacchaeus, he uh, called him out of the sycamore tree, and he goes to his house. Zacchaeus says, I've been corrupt. I need to pay back what I've stolen from my people. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house, for this man is a child of Abraham as well. And then he adds this. This was his purpose. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. That's why he came. That was his purpose. So this man of peace had a great purpose in his life, and he was also definitely a man of prayer. He began his ministry, and it always continued. He always prayed. He prayed by himself. He prayed with a small group. He prayed, prayed on the mountainside. He, he, he uh, prayed when he was in, in uh, the garden. Uh, he prayed for while he was on the cross. He prayed for his enemies. I mean, this was really, he aligned with God. That's the purpose of prayer to align with God. And so he, he became like that, a, a person of great prayer. But if there's one thing maybe that I would characterize about Jesus is that man, man, he loved people. He loved the rich young ruler. He offered him a new way, but he couldn't deal with that. Jesus loved people. He loved the children. He loved the people who were broken. He loved the people that didn't have a chance. He loved the outsiders. He loved the rejected. He loved the people that nobody else loved. He loved the people who were downtrodden, the people that were from the countryside, the people who didn't matter to anybody else, the people who were written off. He loved the Samaritans. He loved the Jews. He loved the pagans. He loved the Gentiles. He loved everybody. He loved his disciples. Even though they were bumbling and inept, Jesus loved people. And so, as I think about this, it's kind of like, you know, if Jesus were to come to your house today, and for 24 hours, he became you. That is, nothing else changed, that your health is your health, your job is your job. If you're single, you'll still be single, married, still be married. Whatever, if you're the boss, you have employees. If you have a boss, then you're, no, you're an employee. Nothing's changed except that Jesus Christ is living in you. And so the question begs itself, how would your life change? How would these things become characteristic in our lives if Jesus for 24 hours came into our lives. And yet, that's what Paul is saying in another spot in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, you've heard this before, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, not ourselves. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world himself, 
not counting their trespasses, their license, against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, that we might become the righteousness of God. And so, my friends, we have nothing at the church other than Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. This isn't about a building. This isn't about programs. This isn't about pastors or staff. This isn't about how comfortable we are. Do we like the music or we don't? This isn't about that. We have one message, only one message, and that is about Jesus Christ. And when we lose that message, we lose the church. And we can never go from that message of who Jesus was. And so sometimes people say, you know, I would like to know more about Jesus, and I would tell you, go to the primary document. Go to the Gospels and read the Gospels. And just get to know and just get to love this one. Let his incarnation be in us. Let us have Jesus Christ and let him bear our sins and all of the shortcomings that we have. Let him take that from us. I don't want you to walk out of here and say, well, you know, I've got to, I've got to get better. Because we go immediately back into this. Instead of saying, I've got to get better, here's what we need to do is we need to say, I need to let Jesus love me more. I need to give myself to him. And when that happens, rather than us evaluating other people based on whether or not they perform, we drop that. We drop our rocks. And rather, we begin to see people as people. I think one of the things about Jesus, why he was so awesome, is because he had that ability to look at people and to pay attention to them. And he'd ask hard questions sometimes. He asked people, do you want to be well, or do you want to continue on like you're living? It's your choice. He asked people hard questions. But he listened to people. And I think one of the problems that we have a lot of times in life is that we don't listen to people. Somebody told me, and I think I may have shared this with you, but it was such a profound, I'm, I'm just kind of telling everybody this story, is of it, uh, about a guy who would... Um, you might come up and you'd say, so, hey, Tom, uh, you have any vacation plans? And this guy, whose name actually is Tom, has learned that instead of saying, yeah, I'm going to do blah, 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 they, Tom would go, well, you know, not a whole lot, not really. And then he would go, how about you? And then the person is asking you the question because really, they don't care about what you're doing. They want to tell you what they're, oh, yes, I'm about to go to Hawaii, you know, and blah, 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 and there it goes. If you don't have friends, it's probably because you don't ask the right question. You're wanting them to talk about your agenda. If you want to have a friend, let them talk about their agenda. And that's what I see Jesus doing. I mean, he had an agenda. He would talk, but the man knew how to listen, and he drew people in because he cared about them. And this is right at the very center of who we are. God forbid that we would ever move off the center of the identity of the, of the incarnation, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, the witness, and he's coming again. This is great news. We have the best news. It beats social media to death. This is great news. Brendan Manning has written a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. I'd highly recommend that. Uh, it's really, it's kind of about this whole topic of grace. He tells a story in there that's just a wonderful story, and I'll close with this. In 1933, Fiedola, Fiorello LaGuardia, you've heard the airport LaGuardia, became mayor of New York City for 12 years. This is the worst, kind of the worst time. The Great Depression's taking place, but also they're having a time uh, for four years of the, of the World War, Second World War. And so he became mayor. He was a very colorful guy. They called him, they called him the little flower because he's five feet, two inches tall. 
and that's generous. He's probably five feet. But he wore in his lapel a carnation. He was the little flower. The guy was outrageous. He had a bigger-than-life personality. So he loved to go with the New York uh, Fire Department and ride on the uh, fire trucks and go to the fires. He loved to go and raid the speakeasies taking place during Prohibition with the New York Police Department. He would buy tickets for entire orphanages to go see the New York Yankees play baseball games. And when there was a strike with a newspaper in New York, then he would get on the radio and he would read to children the funnies. I mean, this, is, this guy is just bigger than life, even though he was kind of small. In January of 1935, it was a very cold evening, and he decided to go to a court, and it was in the poorest ward of New York City. And he walked in, and he told the judge who was presiding, I'm going to preside over the docket for tonight. And there were about 70 people in the room, a lot of different cases, traffic violations and other things, you know, petty, petty crime and stuff. And so he was doing that. He was acting as the judge. He's the mayor, but he's acting as the judge. And so what happens is that there was this one lady that was brought before him, and her crime was that she had stolen one loaf of bread. And there was an irate shopkeeper that, full of law, said, we've got to teach these people you can't do that. We're going to make, an, uh, we're gonna make a, 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 an example out of her. And so, so he prosecuted her for stealing a loaf of bread. So LaGuardia asked the woman, he said, so is this true? She's standing before him in tattered clothing, very, very poor. And she said, yes. And he said, why did you steal a loaf of bread? You know, that's wrong. And she said, well, my daughter's husband deserted the family, and they, they don't have any income. My daughter is sick. She can't work. And as a result of that, my two grandchildren are starving to death. He had a famous sombrero, and he took it off the mayor, and he reached into his billfold, and as he said, you're guilty. I'm pronouncing a sentence on you, a $10 fine or 30 days in jail. He put $10 of his own money in the hat. And then he smiled and he said, I'm paying your fine. I've got to uphold the law, but I'm going to personally pay your fine. And then he said, and furthermore, every person in this courtroom is going to be fined 50 cents because we should not be living in a city that allows that makes it uh, such a difficult thing for a woman like this to live here. She should not have to be selling, she should not have to be stealing for a loaf of bread. We're all going to give her 50 cents. And so the next day in the New York paper, it said, told this story, and how that there were 70 people, including the policeman, the New York policeman, and the shop owner, that had taken her, to, he had to pay 50 cents. 70 people paid. She walked out with $47.50 in a hat. And they said, the paper said, when that happened, everybody in the courtroom stood up and applauded for the mayor. Why? Because we want to be loved. And we want other people to be loved, too. And when we see grace that comes, that bullseye hits us right in the heart. And that's who we are as a church, is that we want all people, regardless of where they've been, we want all people to follow Jesus. And that's why we're here. It's not because we're anything. It's because He is everything. And we give ourselves to Him. And we follow in Him. He's the one who has come. He's the one who has died. He is the one who has resurrected. He's the one who has given us a witness. He is the one who's going to come again. And so we can't lose. This is the best message. This is good news. And as we share this with our world, God uses us to touch hearts and lives. 
So this is our message. If you never ask him to come into your life, this is a perfect opportunity to do so. Dick is going to be leading us as we invite you to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion this day. Wonderful invitation to give your life to Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. As you have heard the claims that we know that Jesus